America, the Essential Learning Edition by David Shy and George Tyndall. An Old New World, Chapter One, The Collision of Cultures in the 16th Century. The core objectives for this chapter are, number one, explain why there were so many diverse human societies in the Americas before Europeans arrived. Number two, Summarize the major developments in Europe that enabled the age of exploration. Number three, describe how the Spanish were able to conquer and colonize the Americas. Number four, assess the impact of the biological exchange between the old and new worlds. And number five, analyze the legacy of the Spanish form of colonization on North American history. The first migration. It's widely believed that the original discovery of America was by Asiatics who found their way across the Bering Strait to Alaska. The migration was probably a result of the Asiatics finding new stone tools like spears and other hunting implements, which they used for hunting large animals. This was during an ice age, so there was actually an ice bridge coming from Asia to Alaska, which would enable them to make this exchange. These people are often called Clovis people because that is where the discovery that uh, was made by archaeologists in the 1930s um, of these first people. Early cultures in the Americas. The most elaborate early civilizations in the quote New World were in South and Central America. One of the earliest was in Central America. It was the Mayans. The Mayans reached their height between 150 and 900 CE. They were a very complex urban society. They had calendars, a written language, a number system that was very similar to the Arabic number system. They actually had reached heights very equal to the Greeks um, at the same time. The Mayans kind of mysteriously disappeared. No one's sure exactly what happened to them. Uh, around 900 CE. Coming after the Mayans were the Aztecs. The Aztecs lived further south than the Mayans, but they were a more warlike people, and they dominated central Mexico from 1100 uh, to the Spanish conquest. The Aztecs expanded their empire through conquering uh, surrounding tribes. As I said earlier, they were very warlike people. They had vast wealth. They built uh, a major capital called Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan had aqueducts, had schools. They had a medical system. They were very um, advanced, as I said. The Aztecs did not engender uh, love from their neighbors, though, because in conquering their neighbors, they enslaved them. They forced them to farm for them and work for them, and they used their conquered neighbors as a uh, sacrifice for their bloody uh, religion. North American civilizations before 1500. One of the major North American civilizations before 1500 were the Puebloan societies. Um, oftentimes the Pueblos are referred to as the Anastasi. They are from the Southwest. The, this was one of the more advanced uh, North American civilizations before 1500. Uh, they built irrigation systems to enable them to farm because the Southwest was so arid, they had to have irrigation systems to allow them to farm. They were farming community, which is uh, one of the uh, ladders that we use for uh, establishing advanced civilizations. Since they were farmers, they did not travel as much. They, they built towns. They had organized religions. They traded with um, people from as far away as Mexico. And so they were a very advanced civilization. Also in the Southwest were the Plains Indians. The Plains Indians are not considered as civilized as the Pueblos uh, because they were semi-nomadic, meaning that while they had regions that they lived in, they did travel a great deal, mostly to hunt the buffalo. Uh, two major Plains tribes were the Mandans and the Pawnees. 
Continuing with the North American civilizations before 1500, we'll move more to the interior of the United States around the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. Many of these cultures are considered mound building cultures because they built uh, large mounds. No one's really sure what the mounds were for. Different societies possibly used them for different things. Um, historians sometimes uh, say that they were used in religious rituals, sometimes as burial sites, but no one's really exactly sure what they were used for, but they're magnificent um, examples of early cultures. Most of the mound building cultures um, were a combination of hunting, farming, and fishing cultures. One of the largest, most well known of these mound building cultures was Cahokia. Cahokia was an, um, a group of Native Americans around uh, St. Louis, Missouri. They were close to the Mississippi River, and at their height, they had about 30,000 residents. America before Columbus. There were three main Native American civilizations east of the Mississippi River before the Europeans came to North America. These three cultures uh, were linked together by common linguistic or language roots. The largest of these were the Algonquins who lived along the Atlantic seaboard. The Algonquins had a unique form of housing called a wigwam. Wigwams in, were dome-like structures. Normally, when we think of Indians in America, we think of teepees, which resemble a triangle. But the Algonquins lived in wigwams, which were more dome-like because they used young sapling trees to bend, uh, to use, um, to make their uh, housing. The Algonquin were also very warlike. Um, to them, they viewed war as kind of a sport, uh, where they would attack their enemies often, and um, it, it became more like a game almost for them. The second group uh, east of the Mississippi were the Iroquois. This group lived in what today we consider upstate New York. There were at least five distinct uh, Iroquois um, tribes or nations, two of which you may have heard of. One is the Oneida, and the other are the Mohawks. The Iroquois practice communal living. Communal living is when you live in a very large community um, where um, it's not the individual or even the ind individual family that's important, it's the entire community. An example would be when the Iroquois went out hunting, um, when they came back, they shared all of the gains from the hunt. So if one um, warrior didn't kill a deer, uh, his family didn't go hungry. They shared the wealth with everyone. The Iroquois lived in these long bark houses, um, and you may have uh, extended families or even multiple families living in one of these long, long bark houses. The Iroquois also were a matrilineal society. Now, a matrilineal society is when your uh, heritage is traced through the mother. This is very different in Western cultures, which Americans are. Uh, our heritage is usually traced through our father. We take our father's last name, etc. But the Iroquois were matrilineal, and that set them apart from other native tribes, but really most civilizations at the time. Because they are matrilineal, the women have a higher place in their society than they do in other Native American societies or even European societies at the time. Uh, in the Iroquois society, women were allowed to sit in um, on the powwows to help make decisions for the tribe. The men still held the highest positions, but women weren't relegated to just cooking and taking care of the children like in most other societies at the time. The um, last of the three civiliza civilizations were the Muscogee. The Muscogee uh, were considered to be the most advanced of all the North American tribes. They lived in the Southeast. Uh, there were five of the Muscogee nations, sometimes referred to as the five civilized tribes. Those tribes include the Chickasaw, 
the Choctaw, the Creek, the Seminole, and the Natchez. Now, of those five civilized tribes, only four still exist. The Natchez Indians were completely uh, slaughtered um, by the French when the French took over uh, the Mississippi area of North America. But the Muscogee are considered to be the most civilized in North America because they had an advanced agricultural society. Uh, because they are an advanced agricultural society, like when we were talking about the Pueblos, um, they built towns, they're less nomadic, uh, and so they began to uh, create the things that we think of as being advanced in culture. They will have a written language, they will have a more organized government. Some of the agricultural products that we see coming from the Muscogee Nation were maize, or which we usually refer to as corn, tobacco, sunflowers, melons, things of that nature. The Muscogee also assimilated very well with the North Americans. They kind of took what worked, I mean, assimilated very well with the Europeans. They took what worked from the Europeans uh, and assimilated it into their own culture. We also believe that um, the Muscogee probably traded with the um, Aztecs because they have found some um, Aztec pottery and things in, um, in the areas where the Muscogee live. So they believe that there were probably some trading there. Eventually, uh, many of the Muscogee tribes, um, after America was created as a nation, uh, many of the Muscogee tribes created um, written constitutions, they even had uh, newspapers, printing presses, um, an organized government, so um, they assimilated very well with the uh, European cultures. The expansion of Europe and the reasons for European exploration. So, so far, we've been talking about the Native American cultures in North America and Central and South America. So these cultures were existing completely on their own, doing their own thing, and the Europeans were existing. So what brought the two cultures together? So long before uh, we have European exploration of the New World, things are beginning to change in Europe. and. There are often considered four major reasons for European exploration. The first of these is the Crusades. Um, the Crusades were uh, the Holy Wars, where the Europeans went to the Holy Land to try to regain uh, the Holy Land uh, for the Christians, because the Muslims had controlled the Holy Land for uh, centuries at this stage. The Crusades as a military exercise are considered pretty much a failure because uh, the Christians did not regain the Holy Land. There were pockets that they regained um, that they later lost and sometimes they held on to them for longer periods of time. But what the Crusades did was um, they brought to the Europeans new products. When the, these European um, knights went off to fight in the, um, the Holy Land, many of them had never left their home villages. They had not even been to London or Paris, much less out of the country. And so they go off to this foreign land and they come into contact with new products, spices, silks, medicines, perfumes, um, new um, military tools, um, things that they had never seen before. And even though uh, they aren't very successful militarily, they bring a lot of these products back with them when they return to Europe. And they share them with their wives and their families. And so then people began to want more of the silks and the spices and the medicines and uh, these new products. And so this brings about the rise of commerce. And so you get some young entrepreneurs, people thinking that there's a better way to make a living than being a knight, than being a soldier fighting. And so now people began to go to uh, the East 
to simply trade to get more of these products and bring more of these products back. And so uh, this rise of commerce begins to upset what we um, consider the feudal system of Europe. Most of you, when you were taking uh, uh, high school world history or something, you probably saw a feudal pyramid like on the slide. Um, at the top of the pyramid is the king and then the nobles, the knights, and the peasants. Well, these classes of people, um, people were stuck into these. You were born into these situations, except for the king, because the king was usually the strongest of the nobles, and oftentimes he got to be king because he killed the other king. But you're pretty much born into these categories, and you can't get out of them. So... When you had these uh, young knights going out and instead of going to the, the Middle East to fight, they're going to get products and bring them back and sell them. And it, they're, they become now a commerce class, a trading class. Um, so where do they fit in the feudal pyramid? They, uh, they don't want to be knights anymore. They want to break out of being these soldiers. They weren't born nobles, so the nobles don't want to let them in. So where do they fit? So what we see happening is what brings about number two, the rise of the nation states. Uh, many of the kings start making alliances with this commerce class. Uh, they will begin to sell these uh, tradesmen titles of nobility, lesser titles. They're not going to be a duke, but they could be a baron or, or something of that nature. And so they begin to sell these uh, tradesmen titles of nobility. And so what this does is it gives the king uh, allies in that noble class. Oftentimes the kings uh, feared the nobles because the nobles were the ones that controlled the knights. The, the nobles paid the knights. So you didn't see national armies. The armies fought for whatever Lord was paying their bills. So now the king is beginning to make these alliances in this noble class, in the aristocracy. Plus, he sold the titles of nobility to these tradesmen. So now the king has something that most of the other nobles don't have, and that's money. The nobles' wealth was through their land, but now the king has money. And so now the king can hire his own knights, and he can begin to create national armies. And so this is what we begin to look at as the rise of nation states. And this is when you begin to have uh, individuals like Henry VII come to power in England. This is Henry VIII's father. Uh, Louis XIV coming to power uh, in France. And so you have this rise of nation states. And it's important to have the rise of nation states because it's once the you have those strong nation states like Spain and England and France and Portugal, now the kings have the money that they can finance expeditions. They can look outside of the new, uh, their homeland, look for other places. Uh, once we were in the feudal system, the king was too busy looking over his shoulder to see if some noble was going to try to assassinate him for him to look out and try to go somewhere else. A third major reason is the Renaissance. The Renaissance is the rebirth. Oftentimes we, we talk about it being the rebirth of art and literature, but really the Renaissance is the rebirth of knowledge, of education. Many of the things that the Greeks and Romans had known and that um, we had established uh, prior to the fall of Rome um, were lost during the Dark Ages. <clears throat> People during the Dark Ages were not encouraged to learn. They were encouraged to work hard, go to church, uh, abide by the sacraments of the Catholic Church, uh, and basically they lived to die. Uh, because when they died, they were going to go to heaven and they would have such a better life than what they had on earth. But the Renaissance opened people's back, minds back up to learning. Um, and so a lot of the science that had been experimented with um, before came back out. And 
people became more inquisitive and they want to learn new things. And um, it's really the Renaissance that takes fire. And without the Renaissance, you couldn't have had the fourth one, which is the search for the all water out. Um, the search for the all water out comes about because of the trade and the rise of commerce. People wanted to find better, faster, more efficient means of getting goods from the Middle East to Europe. Uh, the land routes that they had been using since the Crusades uh, took a long time uh, and they were very expensive because every time you went through another country, you had to pay taxes. So uh, these young entrepreneurs began to think, hey, if we could make an all water route, traveling by water is faster. We can carry more goods at a time. That means we can make more trips instead of once every five or six years, we can go once a year, things like that. And hey, we don't have to pay taxes uh, to all these countries, especially like um, Turkey and um, the Italian city-states, which everybody had to go through to get to uh, get back to Europe. So the search for the all water route was really made possible because of the Renaissance, because we get in the Renaissance uh, safer uh, ships, we get better sailing ships, we get uh, the ability to create better, more accurate maps. Um, people began to not be as afraid to go out before people thought the world was flat and you were going to sail off the edge of the world if you went too far away from the coast. Uh, but the Renaissance brings back this knowledge and this idea that uh, the world is round and so people weren't afraid, as as afraid to go and travel. And so these are considered the, the four major things. They all kind of meld together um, except for the Crusades. You can't say that one really came before the other. The Crusades came first and then the other three things kind of mix in together. Um, to create the reasons for European exploration. Europe looks west. The first of the European countries to become involved in um, the search for the all water route was Portugal. Portugal is right next door to Spain. Actually, it, they cover a uh, very similar area. It's in the little corner of Spain. Um, the One of the reasons that Portugal uh, became involved in westward uh, expansion was because of their uh, ruler, Prince Henry, sometimes referred to as Prince Henry the Navigator. Prince Henry was a Renaissance man. He loved learning. Uh, he loved uh, finding out new things. And so he built a school for sailors in Portugal. And so people that were interested in exploration came from all over um, to study at Prince Henry's school. Prince Henry School wasn't a school like we often think of with the teacher teaching, uh, but more of all of these sailors sharing their ideas, uh, sharing the knowledge that they had. They shared maps, ideas about new, better ways to build sails, new, better equipment like compasses. And, um, and so since they had the school and they had the sailors, uh, it's kind of a natural that Portugal becomes the first country that actually really becomes involved in uh, searching for the all water route and uh, doing westward exploration. One of the first major Portuguese explorers was Bartholomew Dias. Um, he was searching for an all water route to the east. And so he took the traditional route sailing around the west coast of Africa uh, in 1486. Um, Bartholomew and his crew sailed all the way to the tip of Africa to what today we refer to as the Cape of Good Hope. At the time, it was referred to as the Cape of Storms by Dias and his crew, so there must have been some bad weather uh, going on at the time. When they got to the Cape of Good Hope, uh, that was really far away from Portugal and everyone was getting a little nervous, so they stopped there and returned home. But this gave a foundation for future Portuguese explorations and Portugal will begin to uh, trade with West Africa uh, and establish some um, colonies and trading relationships in West Africa. The man that actually found the all water route to the east was Vasco da Gama. Vasco da Gama 
uh, sailed from 1497 to 1498, um, and he followed Diaz's route to the Cape of Good Hope, but he kept going, and he actually found the route all the way, excuse me, all the way to India. Um, so Portugal was the country that actually found the first all-water route to the east, but that doesn't mean other countries won't continue to search, and of course, other countries have been searching while uh, the Portuguese were searching. Another major Portuguese explorer was Pedro Alvarez Cabral. Uh, he sailed for Portugal in 1500. He was en route to India in his 1500 voyage when he was blown off course and he actually ended up in Brazil. So when we look at South America, most of South America is Spanish in, in their roots. They speak Spanish. But Brazil uh, is Portuguese. And so their language is Portuguese. And they, they have these uh, Portuguese roots rather than the Spanish roots. This map just shows us the voyages from Portugal and Spain that eventually led to the colonization of the New World or the Western Hemisphere. The second European country to get actively involved in colonization in the New World, of course, is Spain. And the one that we are most uh, familiar with is Christopher Columbus, because Christopher Columbus accidentally discovered the New World, quote, the New World. Uh, Columbus had actually studied at Prince Henry's school in Portugal, and he had this idea that if the world was round, which most educated people uh, believed it was, then you could get to the east by sailing west. And he tried to sell this idea to the Portuguese crown. But since um, Portugal was already having success sailing around Africa uh, and had almost reached uh, the New World, they had reached the southern tip of Africa, um, <clears throat> they weren't really interested. So after some time, Columbus packed up his stuff and he moved um, uh, over to Spain and he was fortunate in his timing because right about the time that he got to Spain, Spain had uh, completed the wars against the Moors. The Moors were the uh, Muslims that had began invading Spain decades before and um, when Ferdinand and Isabella got married and united the Spanish kingdom, they pooled all of their resources from their two separate kingdoms and staged a war against the Moors and were ultimately able to defeat the Moors and uh, run most of them out of Spain. And so Columbus timing is very good. These wars are over. So he begins to work on uh, convincing Ferdinand and Isabella to um, finance his idea of sailing west to get to the east. <clears throat> Ferdinand was not really very interested in the idea, uh, so Columbus really began uh, focusing on Queen Isabella, and he really focused on her ideas and her strong Christian beliefs, and he promised her that if they would agree to finance this expedition, that uh, they would convert all of the natives that they came into contact with to Christianity. And so then, of course, he won Queen Isabella over, and Isabella and Columbus began working on Ferdinand. So um, King Ferdinand finally um, succumbed, and he agreed to finance Columbus's voyage to the New World. So, <clears throat> um, but Ferdinand didn't want to invest too much money. He gave uh, Columbus three ships, and they were actually some of the older, more outdated ships in the Spanish fleet. Um, and but he promised him that you know if you find great riches, you will get titles and you will get a portion of the the proceeds from these voyages. So it was going to be a win win uh, a win win situation for them. So. Uh, in 1492, Columbus will set out from um, Spain on his trip to um, the, uh, to the what he thinks is the East. Well, there were a couple of problems with Columbus's calculations. Of course, the world is round, and you can get to the East 
by sailing west. However, first of all, um, the world was much larger than Columbus or any Europeans believed. They had no idea. They were so compartmentalized in Europe that they had no idea how large the world actually was. And so once they got out in the middle of the Atlantic, a lot of um, Columbus's sailors actually started panicking because it was taking so long to sight land because they were actually um, on board the ship out in the ocean for about six weeks. The second problem with Columbus's plan to get to the east by sailing west was that there was this huge land mass of North and South America in his way. He had no idea that it was there. So uh, after six weeks of sailing in uh, September of 1492, they finally sight land and Columbus uh, lands in actually what today we would consider to be uh, the Caribbean islands. Um, he landed at San Salvador he we I know we always think of Columbus discovering America and he, he does discover America in the sense of the Americas but he doesn't come to North America actually in all the voyages that Columbus makes he never comes to North America now Columbus did uh, realize when he landed on one of these Caribbean islands San Salvador that he had not actually reached India but he thought he was in some of the barrier islands off the coast of India. Uh, but he and his men go on shore and they begin trying to convert the natives and uh, they gather up some of the local produce and those types of things. But they're not finding the rich spices or the gold or any of those things that they uh, were looking for. So uh, after a few weeks there in San Salvador, they load back up and they return home with the promise that to Ferdinand and Isabella that if they finance them again, they'll go back and they'll, they will find the gold and silver and they will find all the great wealth and spices. Um, Columbus did actually make three voyages to the New World, uh, three additional voyages. Um, he will return the very next year, 1493, 1498, he returns again, and then his last voyage is in 1502. Unfortunately for Columbus, he's never successful in finding all of the wealth that he is looking for because eventually they realize that he's not actually in India or China, that he's actually in a whole new world, but that takes a very long time for them to realize this. And beginning really around um, the end of his voyage in 1493 and then in 1498, they really began to mistreat the Native Americans because Columbus and his men began to think that the natives are hiding the wealth from them. And so they start engaging in torturing them. And then, of course, the, the natives rise up against them. And this is when we begin to have a lot of the fighting between the Native Americans and the Spanish. Uh, on Columbus's last voyage, uh, he actually barely gets to the New World. Um, and he will be arrested and he will be sent back to Spain where Ferdinand and Isabella will strip him of all of his titles. And actually he eventually um, dies in great poverty, no one really recognizing what he had achieved. Um, so it is only after his death that he becomes noted as the founder of the New World. Columbus did, in those altogether four voyages to the New World, he did actually um, claim most of the Caribbean, Cuba, Haiti, Santo Domingo, all of those areas were claimed for Spain and Spain settled in to those areas and eventually we began making money from them. Another famous Spanish explorer was Amerigo Vespucci. Vespucci came to the New World in 1513 and he wrote really great detailed uh, accounts of everything he saw, describing the flora, the fauna, um, the landscapes, everything, the people, 
and he drew a lot of maps. And it's from Amerigo Vespucci's notes and writings and drawings that finally everyone in Europe recognized that Columbus had actually discovered a whole new world. And that's where we get this, this uh, title, the new world. Uh, some German map makers began to refer to this new world as Amerigo's land. And this is actually our namesake. This is why uh, North and South America, Central America were known as the Americas because we're named for Amerigo Vespucci. Another famous uh, Spanish explorer that was one of these well-educated Spanish explorers was Vasco Balboa. Uh, Balboa is noted for discovering the Pacific Ocean in 1513. Now, we don't know if Balboa was the first European to see it, but we do know that Balboa was the first European to document seeing the Pacific Ocean, and he actually named it the Pacific because the Pacific is much calmer than the Atlantic Ocean, and so that's how it got its name. The next group of Spanish explorers that we're going to talk about, beginning with Hernan Cortes, were actually the old conquistadors, the old soldiers that had fought in the Moor Wars in um, Spain. And they are not seeking knowledge as much as they are seeking fame and fortune. Um, they're... Um, they after the wars they didn't want to return home to their dull lives they wanted to go out and and have some more adventure and make a name for themselves and get get rich in the new world and so uh we're going to have a whole group of these guys that we're going to talk about some of the main ones that come to the new world hernan cortez was the first of these he arrived off the coast of mexico around 1519 uh, with about 600 soldiers and with these 600 soldiers, because of uh, a lot of good luck for him and bad luck for the Aztecs who lived in that region, and some um, underhanded dealings, he and the 600 soldiers were actually able to conquer the vast Aztec Empire. This Aztec Empire that had conquered most of the other native populations populations in Central America and that had a very organized governmental structure and a very organized government uh, and an organized army. Uh, Hernan Cortes with these 600 soldiers were actually able to uh, conquer this. Uh, they Part of the way they did it was they incited the, the native tribes living around the Aztec tribes against the Aztecs. And that really wasn't that hard to do because the Aztecs, as they had conquered these tribes, they had um, used the, the conquered people as slaves. They had um, used them as sacrifices in their bloody uh, religious rituals. And so it wasn't that difficult for them to recruit these people to rise up against the Aztecs and help them. Uh, in this endeavor to uh, capture them. And within a two-year period, by 1521, uh, the Spanish had conquered the Aztec Empire and gained control of what today we consider Mexico. And finally, um, Spain has what it wants. Uh, Mexico is very we wealthy in the forms of gold and silver and many jewels, um, that are found in Mexico, but also some really awesome uh, plants that we've added to our uh, culture, like cocoa. Uh, some of the best chocolate cocoa in the world first originated from Mexico. And so Cortes becomes a great hero in Spain because he was able to do what Columbus was not able to do, and that was find the great wealth that Spain was actually looking for uh, in exploring the new world. Some of the factors that contributed, of course, to the Spanish success was that they had superior technology. Uh, they had guns. At this time, of course, the guns are just muskets, but the, the natives only have 
spears and bows and arrows and those types of things. So the guns are actually more deadly. And they had horses. We often think that horses are a very American thing, meaning all of the Americas, but horses actually came from Europe. And at first, when the natives saw humans riding these big beasts, these big animals, they felt that uh, Cortez and his men must be gods because they could control these large animals. Um, and of course, the, the animals, the horses made it much easier for them to move from place to place more quickly. And they will engage with them in cavalry type tactics that will also enable them to defeat the Aztecs. As I mentioned earlier on the previous slide, they also forged alliances with uh, the other tribes around the Aztecs and incited them against the Aztecs. But one of the biggest factors was the European diseases. The Aztecs, of course, remember, have never been in contact with Europeans. And so when the Europeans came and they would uh, contract things like smallpox or uh, a cold or a flu uh, that was uh, a virus that came from Europe, it would have devastating effect on the Aztec people. Um, at one point, it was estimated that about 40% of the Aztec population in central Mexico died of smallpox in just one year. So these factors, of course, uh, are huge reasons why the this small band of 600 soldiers could defeat this massive um, Native American um, population. Another one of these conquistadors that conquered a great empire in the New World was Francisco Pizarro. He came to the New World in 1532 and he gained notoriety for conquering the, uh, the Inca Empire in Peru. Before Pizarro and his forces got to Peru, uh, there had been a civil war in uh, the Inca Empire and um, during that civil war, um, they uh, uh, well, what had happened before was <clears throat> the Inca, the, the chief of the tribe, was also known as Inca. He had died without naming a successor. And so there was a contest between who would take over the throne. And so there's this big civil war. And eventually, right before Pizarro gets there, um, they have a new Inca, but the the tribes are the tribes in the Inca Empire are still somewhat uh, separated. They don't really trust each other that well, and they're greatly weakened from this civil war. So uh, Pizarro is going to be able to play up on that. And one of the things that Pizarro decided that he would do is that he would kidnap the Inca and hold him for ransom, which he did. And he promised the Incas that if they would um, pay this massive ransom, fill this room with gold and silver, that he would um, <clears throat> release the Inca. So the Incas got together and they pooled all their resources and they, and they gave him what he wanted. They gave him all this money, all this wealth. But still, he killed the Inca, which caused even more chaos uh, because they had just had this civil war. They barely have a new Inca, and now this Inca has been killed. And it's through this chaos that ensues with the lack of leadership uh, and organization that Pizarro and his forces are able to capture the Inca Empire in Peru. And the, and the Inca Empire was even more with wealthy in the forms of gold and silver than the Aztec Empire. So with the combination of the conquering of the Aztecs and the Incas, Spain became the richest country in Europe because then they began to exploit that wealth that they found in Peru and Mexico. And they began to excavate all the gold and silver, all the jewel stones, anything that has any value, they began to excavate that using usually the Indians as slaves um, before they began to import African Americans as slaves. So blacks from Africa will actually be brought into South America by the Spanish uh, will be our first slaves in the Western Hemisphere. But they, they use this slave labor to um, get all of this wealth that they can and they ship it back to Spain. And so Spain becomes the wealthiest country in Europe. And based on the 
ideas of mercantilism, wealth equals power. So Spain was recognized then as the most powerful country in Europe. In addition to Cortes and Pizarro, who conquered great empires in North America and South America and gained a lot of wealth for the Spanish, there's some other notable explorers that um, we, we should talk about. Um, we could go on and on talking about all the Spanish explorers, but I've only picked a few that made some very notable contributions. Ferdinand Magellan, of course, is probably one that most everyone's heard of because he was the first uh, person to circumnavigate the globe, which just simply means sail around the world. Magellan's uh, trip um, proved that the world was round, that you could sail all the way around the globe. Now, Magellan himself did not complete the entire voyage. He died in the Philippines. Uh, he was actually killed by some natives there. There was an altercation and he was killed, but his expedition was completed. And so once Magellan's expedition had completed this uh, voyage around the world, there's really no doubt that the world is round. So the world being flat was pretty much laid to rest at that time. Another famous Spanish explorer was Ponce de Leon. Ponce de Leon discovered the Fountain of Youth in Florida. Uh, he was one of these older conquistadors, and when he came to uh, <clears throat> Central America after the uh, conquering of the Aztec Empire, he wanted to make kind of a name for himself. And so the Native Americans began uh, telling him about this fabled fountain of youth that if you drank with water from this fountain it would restore your youth and you would be forever young and so he went out exploring and in his explorations he ends up in Florida and he discovered Florida for the Spanish and claimed uh, Florida for the Spanish and off and on throughout the entire colonial period. Florida mostly belonged to Spain, but at times it would revert to the British, but mostly it belonged to Spain. Then we have Hernando Cortes. He was also one of these uh, conquistadors that came to Central America and he went off exploring um, and he actually discovers the Mississippi River and he actually names the Mississippi River. De Soto did not live, um, outlive his expedition either. He actually died on the expedition and he was actually buried in the Mississippi River. And then another notable Spanish explorer was Francisco Coronado. He too was looking for gold. He, all of these guys want to make a name for themselves, you know. Um, they don't want to be in the shadow of Cortez uh, or Pizarro. So Coronado wanted to find gold on his own. And so he heard these tales that there were these seven cities of gold. And so he set off exploring, looking for those. And he went further uh, west into uh, what today we consider the southwestern areas of the United States. And so in his explorations, um, he claimed um, like New Mexico, Colorado, California, all of those areas uh, ultimately became Spanish possessions because of Coronado's ex, uh, explorations. Now Coronado never actually found the seven cities of gold. There weren't seven cities of gold, but he did find uh, the Pueblo Indians in the Southwest. And at first he thought because, you know, they the Pueblos live in these um, adobe houses and they were very intricate villages that they built. Um, out of this adobe, he thought that he may have found the seven cities of gold, but of course there was no gold in New Mexico and um, that area where the Pueblos live. But um, they don't find any extra gold, but they do expand the Spanish Empire. And so from moving from just Mexico and then Peru, Spain is going to control eventually most of the Western Hemisphere, both North and South America. This map just shows us some of those explorations we were just talking about, where exactly the Aztecs uh, were 
and uh, where the uh, Incas were and how Spain was able to move from those areas and capture those areas. One of the big things that we look at when we talk about the early Spanish uh, incursions into the Western Hemisphere is what we call the Columbian Exchange, or sometimes it's referred to as the cultural exchanges. Both the Native Americans and the Europeans gained some knowledge and some um, new plants and um, animals and from each other. For the most part, though, when we look at it, the Europeans gained a lot more than the Native Americans because, of course, the Native Americans are going to be um, subjugated by the European countries um, for the most part. Um, the Europeans are going to gain, of course, gold and silver, but the, the Native Americans, as we just discussed, gained horses. Both sides are going to gain new crops. On our next slide, we're going to look at uh, some of the crops and animals that were exchanged between the two. The, there were diseases, mostly Europeans bringing diseases to the Native Americans, but we'll see that the Native Americans also shared a little disease with Europeans too. There wasn't much uh, language exchange on the part of the Europeans learning Native American languages. We see that the Europeans uh, mostly believe that the natives were barbarians and the natives should learn their languages. Uh, the exception being the French. Uh, the French will, because of the way that they are going to interact with the Native Americans, which we'll learn about later, uh, the French did actually learn Native American languages, but the Spanish and the English believed that it was up to the Native Americans to learn their language. Same with religion. We don't see the Europeans converting to uh, Native American practices of uh, praising the gods of the water or the sun and um, we, the Christianity, and at this time Christianity meant Roman Catholicism, Christianity will be uh, imposed, forcefully imposed in many cases on the Native Americans. So this chart shows you many of the um, goods that were exchanged between the two. I'm not going to read them to you. You can read them yourself or you can in this PowerPoint or the PowerPoint that's in Canvas that does, doesn't have any video or audio. But you can see there's many diseases that were transmitted from the new world, from the old world to the new world. There were also uh, animals uh, that went both ways. And the big exchange, of course, the big positive exchange was both sides gained a lot of new crops. Uh, a lot of times we think about the um, things like, you know, corn that uh, was that came from the Native Americans, uh, but we we don't always think about things like sugar actually came from Europe. We grow it very well in the Western Hemisphere, especially in the Caribbean, but things like sugar and coffee, which some of the best coffee in the world is grown in Colombia, um, actually first started in the old world and came to the new world. So there was a more even exchange when it came to agricultural products, uh, but you can see that from this map. The next European country that got involved in exploration and eventually came to the New World was France. The French were searching for what they called the Northwest Passage. This was a belief among many European countries that there must be a body of water that broke up this vast landmass of North and South America. And of course, there isn't, uh, not until the 19th 1900s when Teddy Roosevelt builds the Panama Canal, but they spent a lot of time searching for this Northwest Passage because if they can't find the Northwest Passage, the only way to get around North and South America is to sail all the way around South America to try to get to China and the East. So the first French explorer was Giovanni de Veranzano. Um, he came over in 1524, like I said, searching for the Northwest Passage. He did discover, not the Northwest Passage, but he discovered Newfoundland, which is in that upper area of Canada. 
and he gave it that title, Newfound Land. Um, the, the French built some small villages in the area and they left a, a handful of people there, but we're going to see that there's not going to be a great deal of uh, movement as far as migration to uh, Newfoundland to live. It's very cold, it's very harsh uh, climate area, and so the French just kind of hold on to it for some time before they really are able to make a lot of use of it. Then we see that there's kind of a delay of 10 years before the next major French explorer into the New World, and this is Jacques Cartier in 1534. Uh, playing on Baranzano's discovery of Newfoundland, the French then are claiming uh, what ultimately is Canada. He begins exploring, looking for this Northwest Passage, and he finds the St. Lawrence River. At first, they think this has to be the passage that cuts across east to west, across the uh, Americas. But it is not, of course, the St. Lawrence River flows north to south, not east to west. And um, but Cartier found the St. Lawrence River, which is the largest river in Canada. It's like our Mississippi River here in uh, the United States. And he claimed all of the lands drained by the St. Lawrence River uh, as French. And he began to uh, bring some more um, people here. We see a few more settlers coming into like Quebec. Quebec is built. Um, but the real main explorer for the French that finally found something to make uh, the French gain some wealth from their explorations in the New World was Samuel de Champlain. Champlain came to the New World in 1603 and he began doing further explorations around the St. Lawrence River, claiming more and more territories for the French. And because of his work there, uh, he became nicknamed the father of New France. The main thing Champlain did though, was he found a source of wealth for the French. If the French had continued to come up empty handed finding the Northwest Passage and they weren't finding any gold and silver, everybody's looking for gold and silver after the great abundance that was found in Peru and Mexico. Um, but he found that in this rich, cold, deeply forested areas of Canada, they had animals that had lush furs. And so Champlain began working with the native tribes in Canada, um, hiring them basically, working with them to uh, develop a fur trade. And this is the reason that the French have, for the most part, a better relationship with the Native Americans than other European countries because they actually worked with the Native Americans. The French, for the most part, went out into the um, the forest lands and they live with the natives and hunted with them and then we we see that there are fur trading posts that are established throughout the wilderness and so the french learned the native american language they lived off the land and the natives don't see the french as invasive when the european when the english come the english destroy everything. They want to build farms and they cut down the trees and they want the Indians to leave. Uh, the French don't do that because they are actually living among the natives and hunting with them and their goal is to gain furs. Now a problem with the French is that because of their lifestyle in the New World they never bring a lot of uh, families to the New World. Mostly it's male inhabitants and they mostly stay for short periods of time. When the English come, the English come with the idea that they're going to build England in the New World. The, the French come with the idea that they're going to stay here for a little while, get wealthy, and then move back to France. And so we don't see huge populations of French people moving into Canada. And we, with the exception of places like Quebec and Montreal and Toronto, we don't see large settlements being developed by the French.
Another group of Europeans that came to the New World were the Dutch from the Netherlands. Uh, they sent their first explorer here in 1609, Henry Hudson. And Henry Hudson discovered the Hudson River. That's why it has its name. They discover, they explored around the area of what today we consider New York, and they named it, of course, the New Netherlands. New York was bigger than it is today. The New Netherlands was. Uh, it encompassed all of what would be New York State, uh, New Jersey, Delaware. All of that was part of the New Netherlands, and they called it the New Netherlands. Uh, Peter Minuet was one of the early governors of the New Netherlands, and he is the one that's famous for negotiating with the Native Americans to buy Manhattan Island. Um, the the Dutch, or uh, for the most part, um, practiced an economy very similar to the French. They did a lot of fur trading and trapping because you have rich forest lands there with good animals for fur trading. And that also meant that they could didn't bring a lot of people in. The other problem that the French the the Dutch have, excuse me, the Dutch um it was actually um the new the Netherlands was actually a very uh, wealthy country and there weren't a lot of unemployed people and they had a lot of religious freedom there and so a lot of people were not interested in leaving the netherlands and so to try to entice people to come to the new world um the dutch uh, initiated what became known as the patroon system and the way this would work is that they would promise people that if they could um if you can get 50 settlers to come live in the New Netherlands, then we will give you a very large tract of land and you will basically have feudal rights over that land. You can do whatever you want. Um, you will have a lot of power over that land. Even with this platoon system, we see that uh, not a lot of people wanted to leave the Netherlands because it was just frankly, a good place to live and they had more religious freedoms and more wealth than uh, the British or the French or any of the other European uh, countries. Another group that had a very brief stay in the New World were the Swedish. Uh, the Swedish came in 1638 and they settled around uh, the Delaware River which is also an area where the Dutch had settled but the Dutch had been there first. And so the Swedes built Fort Christina on the Delaware River. But for the few years that they are there, they're almost in constant warfare with the Dutch over um, who actually controls the land. Eventually, the Swedes will give up and go home and the Dutch will take over Fort Christina. But one of the things I always like to mention about the Swedish is that it was actually the Swedish that brought the log cabin to the New World. We think about the log cabin as being something uniquely American, but actually it was not. It was actually brought here by the Swedes. Okay, and so now we finally get to the English, and for most of the rest of the class, we're going to talk about the English explorations, most of the rest of the chapters. The English get involved in exploration uh, in the New World a lot later than the other countries because of all the turmoil in their country about the succession, who's going to inherit the throne after Henry VIII dies, and all of that turmoil that you will learn about if you take Western civilization. But one of the reasons for English colonization was mercantilism. Uh, the mercantilism is an economic concept that was very popular in Europe at this time. Actually, it was the economic concept of Europe at this time. And under the system of mercantilism, wealth equal greatness. And when they're talking about wealth in the 1600s, they're talking about actual gold and silver. They're not talking about property. They're not talking about these more abstract things that we talk about today with countries like their gross domestic product and that kind of thing. They're talking about actual gold and silver. And that's why Spain was considered to be the wealthiest and most powerful country in Europe. 
under this system, the way the British kind of laid it out was if wealth equal greatness, then a country needs to become self-sufficient. Because if you're buying goods from another country, then you are spending your wealth and that's making you poorer. And England, of course, is a small island country at this time. And so they were not economically self-sufficient. They bought things from other countries. And so they began to look at moving to this new world, the Western Hemisphere, to develop colonies that would benefit the mother country. So when the British began, the English began building colonies, the main idea as far as the English government was concerned for building the colonies was that the colonies would benefit the mother country. That's important to keep in mind when we get closer to the American Revolution because England never expected the colonies to be wealthy on their own. The colonies were there to provide raw materials for the mother country. The colonies were there to benefit the mother country, not the other way around. Um, an individual that played a big role in promoting colonization in the Western Hemisphere was Richard Hakalut. And Richard Hakalut wrote um, a, a pamphlet, an article called The Discourse on Western Planting. And this meant uh, immigrating, having people immigrate to the Western Hemisphere. What had happened in England was they had this thing called the enclosure movement where they took a lot of the common lands that had always been available in the villages and they began to enclose them uh, and that threw a lot of serfs off the land and they didn't have a place to go and commonly graze their uh, cattle, their, their sheep and um, things of that nature. So this enclosure movement caused unemployment in England. And so Hakalut argues that we have these people that are poor, they're unemployed, they're coming into the cities, they're causing problems. And so instead of us putting them into debtor's prison, why not send them to the new world uh, to build colonies and then they can start growing crops that we need and eventually his ideas really take root especially when we get to Elizabeth the first she's a real big follower of Hakalut and um, it is a good idea it's a win-win situation because if you've got the opportunity to go to the new world and instead of going to debtor's prison you probably want to go to the new world and of course, one of the big factors for European exploration that we've all heard about since we were little kids was the English came to the New World for religious freedom. And there were religious incentives for them coming to the New World. Um, after Henry VIII um, divorced his first wife and England separated from the Roman Catholic Church, they had what they called the English Reformation. And England became a Protestant country. It was one of the first countries to adopt Protestantism. The Church of England, or what we will later call uh, the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church, was very similar to the Catholic Church, except without the Pope. Instead of the Pope running the church, the king ran the church, that king being Henry VIII. And then when Henry VIII dies, then his successors will run the church. Well, some people did not want to leave the Catholic Church and others in England said, well, if we're going to leave the Catholic Church, we should completely leave it and change it, change it completely. But under English law and in most European countries, the citizens have to be the same religion as the king. So when Henry VIII left the Catholic Church, that meant all of the English people had to leave. And if you did not, if you wanted to remain a Catholic, you were persecuted. Um, later, after um, the Anglican Church has been the Church of England for a number of years, um, there's a group that grows up in England called the Puritans. The Puritans wanted to purify the Anglican Church or the Church of England. They said that it was too, uh, too much like the Catholic Church and they wanted it to be more simple just a real simple basic 
church without all the pomp and circumstance of the Catholic Church. And it was illegal for these people also to practice their Puritan religion, and they began to be persecuted. So especially the pilgrims do come to America for religious freedom, but we'll see they're not the actual first people that come to America. Every colony was not founded for religious freedom. Only a couple of the colonies we'll see when we get to chapter four uh, were actually found for religious freedom, but freedom of religion was a factor in uh, English colonization. When Henry VIII died, he had three children. One son, who was actually his youngest child, Edward, and then he had two daughters, Mary by Catherine of Oregon, uh, she was the oldest, and then Elizabeth. Edward, because he was the male, inherited the throne first, but he was, as I said, he was the youngest, and he was always very sickly, and he inherited the throne actually when he was really young. He was still a teenager, and he did not um, serve for very long, and unfortunately he died and then Mary inherited the throne because she was the oldest daughter and after a very turbulent period where Mary tried to reconvert your uh, England to Catholicism um, and she prosecuted and executed a lot of uh, non-Catholics in Great Britain Mary also died without having any children so Henry's youngest daughter uh, the daughter of Anne Boleyn, uh, Elizabeth I, inherited the throne. And when Elizabeth came in, frankly, Great Britain was a mess after Mary. And Elizabeth first decided that um, the people would be members of the Church of England. England would not move back to Catholicism. It was pretty much ingrained now that the people were part of the Church of England, and they would stay that. But she was just going to kind of like ignore the people on the down low if you don't flash your catholicism uh or you don't flash your puritanism around me hey that's okay just as long as you pay your taxes to the church of england and at least pretend that you support the church of england that's okay and so that settled a lot of the religious problems for a while in england England is also a very poor country at this time. It's kind of like the, the poor cousin to the French and the Spanish. And Elizabeth wants to be equal to these other countries, but she doesn't have the money or the resources to really begin exploring in the new world. So the first thing she does is she mobilizes uh, a group of privateers to begin to attack Spanish shipping. Now, basically, a privateer is just a licensed pirate. Um, Elizabeth called these privateers, and the English public began to call these privateers the sea dogs. Um, a licensed pirate means that under English law, what they're doing is legal. So when they go out and they attack a Spanish ship and steal all the gold and silver off of the ship, if they get back to England, they're great heroes. But if the Spanish capture them, they are not going to have a very good fate, and they're going to be hanged as pirates. Um, but the Sea Dogs were very successful in gaining a lot of wealth for England and, of course, for themselves. Probably one of the most famous of all the Sea Dogs was Sir Francis Drake, who was a really good friend of Elizabeth. But Elizabeth's plundering of Spanish shipping caused the King of Spain. Philip II to um, be quite angry and Philip II decided that he was going to uh, silence Elizabeth by taking over England. So he put together this huge fleet of ships that became known as the Great Spanish Armada and they set out to attack England and try to take over England in 1588. And honestly most people felt that the Spanish Armada, this invincible Armada, as it was called, would be successful. But a lot of things happened that uh, caused them to be unsuccessful. One, very early in the voyage, they ran into some really bad weather, almost like hurricane strength weather, and a lot of the ships were damaged. Some of them had to return home. Some were blown off course, so the whole Armada never actually reached England. 
Secondly, uh, Philip had greatly underestimated what people would do to defend their homes, and the British just mobilized to the man. Uh, they used their fishing vessels, they armed farmers, anybody, and the English all came out to defend their um, their homeland. And to the surprise of most of Europe, and especially Philip II, the British were able to defeat the Spanish and um, the defeat of the Spanish Armada is very important because for English history, it marked a real turning point. The Spanish had been harassing the English really since Henry VIII had divorced Catherine of Oregon, who was a Spanish princess. And there had been bad feelings and the English were always looking over their shoulder that the Spanish might invade. And finally, with the defeat of the Spanish Armada, they have put this to rest. Uh, Philip II will not make another attempt to attack the, uh, the English. And now with the defeat of the Spanish Armada, the English can then begin looking at exploring, uh, exploring into uh, the new world and hopefully gaining wealth for themselves. The first English attempt at colonization in the New World was actually before the Spanish uh, defeat of the Spanish Ar Armada in 1584. It was not a government program. It was done by some English citizens. Um, Sir Humphrey Gilbert and Sir Walter Raleigh went to Queen Elizabeth and asked if they could use their own money uh, to build a colony in the New World. And Elizabeth said yes, because they're using their own money. And if they're successful, England will have a uh, foothold in the New World. Well, Sir Walter Raleigh and Humphrey Gilbert were not successful. <laughs> they, they went over there, they spent a lot of money, they took some settlers there, but um, they ran into difficulty with the weather. They originally built the first village too close to the James River and they had problems with mosquitoes and malaria. They had problems with the Native Americans and after about 10 months um, the settlers said we want to go home. This is not worth it. We want to go home. So they actually came home. Then uh, a couple of years later John White goes back to Elizabeth and says well I would like to try again at uh, building on what Humphrey Gilbert and Walter Raleigh did at Roanoke. I know they went broke, uh, they, it wasn't successful, but I have a whole different group of people and I think we can make it successful. So John White is going to go over there a couple of years later and um, with about a hundred settlers and really develop what we began to call Roanoke. After several months, uh, the settlers got established, they built settlements, they built a fort to protect themselves, and John White came back to England with the idea that he was going to get more provisions and then bring some more settlers over. Well, in the meantime, of course, we uh, run into difficulties. There's the invasion of the Spanish Armada. There's a lot of things that happen, and so he doesn't actually make it back. Um, until uh, 1589. And when he makes it back, he gets there and all the settlers at Roanoke are gone. And that's why we call this the Lost Colony, the Lost Colony of Roanoke. But the weird thing was, it didn't look like there had been a battle there. There wasn't like the fort wasn't burned, there weren't bodies and destruction from a battle, but it was just like the settlers had packed up and left. And we still don't know for sure to this day exactly what happened to the settlers at Roanoke. A lot of people believe that they were being uh, harassed by some of the more aggressive Native American tribes in that area um, and maybe some of the uh, friendlier tribes took them in, but we're not totally uh, sure what exactly happened at Roanoke, but it was a bust. They didn't make money from it. And so it's going to be a, a little while longer uh, before uh, the English are going to dip their toe back into uh, colonization. This is just an artist's depiction of what the Roanoke um, 
colony would look like. By the way, it was off the coast of, of, of the Carolinas. I forgot to tell you that Roanoke was an island off the coast of the Carolinas. And this is just an artist's depiction of what it may have looked like. This map depicts the French, English, and Dutch explorations um, of the New World. You can look at that and get an idea of where they came from and where they settled uh, as you're kind of wrapping your head around what we've been discussing in the chapter. And this actually brings an end to the chapter one discussions.